Work, workforce, and workplace norms are shaped as much by popularized portrayals as they are by our lived experiences. From sensational headlines, like The Great Resignation, to successful series, like The Office and Silicon Valley, to skits and stories shared on our social media feeds, what we see shapes what we believe. Let's go behind the scenes to discover what's new now and next in the world of work, and we'll challenge the traditions of what it means to live well and to work well. This is Success From Anywhere. Today on Success From Anywhere, we'll discover how hosting a steak dinner became the intermezzo in a high-stakes startup. His entree into entrepreneurship is addressing a $1 trillion gap between employers and employees. Please join me in welcoming to the show Rob Whalen, CEO and co-founder at PTO Exchange. Hey, Rob. Hey, Karen. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. And because we talk about work a lot on the show, one question I like to ask every guest, what was your first paying job and how did that job inform or inspire your career trajectory? Uh, my first job was at 11 and a half. I had a paper route. So I got up. Well, it wasn't the morning route. It was the Seattle time. So it was the afternoon delivery. So every day after school, uh, I'd get off the bus and go to the paper shack, get my papers and deliver papers to the to the neighborhood. And then at the end of the month, I'd have to go and collect my money. Hey, when you have your own business like you do now, collections is a valuable skill. It is a valuable skill. It's what, it's one of those nobody likes to do, but it's it's how you make the money. So yeah, I did that in order to, you know, pay for some of the things that I, I wanted to do personally. You know, I had to do it every day. I can relate. I build a babysitting empire. And part of the upside was money for the things that your parents were not going to fund for you. And that's exactly it, right? We, I grew up in a family of nine. Um, I was seven out of nine. And so, you know, there just wasn't a lot to go around. I mean, I had a lot. Don't get me wrong. We had a lot in the family, but, you know, like going skiing or buying a particular bicycle or, you know, those things just weren't in the budget. And so I went out and worked for it so I could afford those things. You and I share the title of, you know, being emeritus employees of Cisco, the technology company. And I'm curious, what inspired you to step out of the enterprise space and into the entrepreneurial space? So prior prior to joining Cisco, or I, I actually started at WebEx first, and then they bought WebEx. Prior to that, I had started a couple of companies prior to that as well. So in the software business, and one of them was successful, we sold it. The other one, you know, went down in flames, actually not in flames, but we wound up selling the technology, <laughs> didn't make any money off of it. And then, you know, I would go to work for great companies like Cisco. So I always have had this, you know, I side hustle part of me that said, hey, you know, you need to just solve problems. And that's really what I'm good at is solving problems. And so entrepreneurship, that is all it ever is, is, is solving problems. This opportunity came... <laughs> like you were saying at, at, at a dinner, right? And there was a couple of us that um, had kind of left Cisco and we got this this payout. And, and I believe mine was somewhere in the 30 plus thousand dollars that I got a check written out for because I had 280 hours of PTO. And we were just drinking and having steak and you know, there's 14 of us. And <clears throat> the other one said, well, wouldn't it have been nice if we could put it in our 401k while we were there or use it on a bit? And that's when the light bulb moment came and then we just said, well, I wonder if you could do that. Say more about the problem you're solving. I mean, we've been talking a lot on the show about the gap between what employers offer and what employees expect. And you saw a series of either problems to solve really on both halves of that equation for the employers as well as the employees. And this this problem you're solving is a significant financial impact for all humans gathered around that equation. It is. And I think I think one of the things that that I brought to the table was just my accounting background that because I graduated in accounting. Um, so I understood what was going on in the balance sheet and how PTO was accrued. And then it sits on the balance sheet as a liability offset by cash. 
but it grows over time, which is really interesting. And people don't kind of understand this part of it. <clears throat> so let's say I accrued my wage at $30,000. I made $30,000 a year. I accrued the PTO that year. And then I rolled it over the next year and I made 40,000. Well, the company has to make a journal entry to, you know, true up those hours. So it becomes a growing liability for the enterprise or for the company itself. But on the other side, the employee side, there's policies in place. Like sometimes you can only roll over maybe a week of time. You had two weeks. And so you just lost a week of time that you didn't take off. And you, you as the good employee, you worked that time, but you didn't get paid for it. And so we saw this disconnect in how PTO was really being leveraged. And so we thought if you could give more control to the employee, if you could allow them to do more things with that benefit dollar and allow them to put it in their 401k or pay down student loans, would that have a, a greater effect on the company as far as a retention tool, an attraction tool? And we're finding that that is the case. And so that's the kind of the two-sided problem that we're solving right now. Give us more examples of what you've discovered people prefer to transfer their PTO hours to become. I mean, when I first interviewed you for Authority Magazine, this was a mind-blowing concept to me. The thought that your PTO could work the way that your health savings account does. Say more about the options you've discovered that people value or prefer to traditional PTO hours. Well, I will say the number one thing people like to do is just cash it out. They like the cash, period. People like to get the cash, extra money. <clears throat> and in today's world where almost 65% of your workforce doesn't have $400 in their savings account, but yet they have roughly $1,500 in their PTO account, the ability to access that and to bridge some of those things so that the employee doesn't have to access their 401k for a hardship loan or go to a you know, a day lender or even do the earned wage access thing, right? Because they're fronting their, their cash flow. So cash out is probably the number one thing. The next one is, again, all around financial wellness, student loan uh, repayment, right? Trying to pay down your student loan debt or putting in your 401k or your HSA are the ones that are really big with us. These employees can't you know, put $22,000 in their 401k every year. So if they could put an extra $500 in there, it goes a long way for their future because it gets the compounding interest, it gets all the tax benefits. <clears throat> and I think one of the things we have learned around this, what benefit, every benefit dollar is not created equal. Benefit, a, a dollar going to your 401k is more advantageous to you than, than just cashing it out because it's going in into pre-tax dollars, right? Same with HSA, you get the triple tax benefit. A dollar paying down student loan debt, you know, because of the compounding time value of money, it's, you know, so you need to start thinking about how do you use these dollars to set yourself up for uh, better financial wellness, which is then just helps you downstream to live your life better. What I'm hearing you say is that helping people build financial acumen is a part of what the PTO exchange is doing. When I'm hearing you talk about the time value of money and perhaps as opposed to compounded interest on your student loan, you get the compounded interest of you put money in a 401k pre-tax over time, possibly employer matching. Say more about what organizations could be doing to improve the financial acumen and you use the phrase financial well-being of their employees. I think for companies today, they need to look at their total benefit dollars that they're, they're allocating to their employees and understanding, one, what is the engagement and, and uptick of those, right? How, how many people are taking advantage of them? And then understanding where their employees are in their financial life cycle. I know this takes work for an employer to do, but when they do it, they can then match their benefits with their employees. And having a benefit that is flexible enough so that you can meet the needs of a multi-generational workforce is, is extremely important in today's world. It, it, it's, it's important because 
the person who is 50 plus has different needs than the person who is 24 coming out of college with debt. The the woman or or man who have a family and two children at 32, you know, trying to, you know, save for college, trying to do all these different types of financial things that they have to do throughout their life cycle. They're all different and everyone is different. What you're doing with what you described is poking holes in this very popular myth or misconception that personalization at scale is expensive or almost impossible. And what you just outlined is a way to meet your employees where they are at every age and stage and offer what people most want, which is flexibility and choice. And to paraphrase what you were saying, to choose what is of benefit to them relative to where they are. And I interview a lot of employers on the show who are perplexed at and trying to drive adoption programs to get employees to utilize their PTO. I'm curious what kind of adoption statistics you have. I mean, does this change the uptick or utilization by employees of the PTO hours that they're given? Yes, it does. It will increase the utilization of the PTO dollars. Now, we have some clients that don't want that, right? Because they make money on unused PTO. I mean, we do. We have, that's an, that's a, an employer type that will say, we make money off the backs of our employees not using their PTO because we have a user to lose it. If they don't use it, you know, we got the productivity and they didn't get the, you know, they didn't get the wages. We're finding that far less as we kind of grow our business and our idea starts to uh, scale. But what we find most interesting is just how certain plans, once you turn them on, have an effect on your um, employee population. Roughly, we get around 27 to 28 percent, depending on the plans uh, of engagement on our platform from the employee community. But a lot of them, a lot of them are the rank and file. A lot of them are the ones trying to bridge that gap. You know, it's not the executives. They don't they don't need the the money. They don't need, the, you know, those types of things sometimes. But the rank and file, they need to be able to cash out to make, you know, rent they, they or pay down uh, their student loan. They're the ones looking at saying, I can't afford to take 3% of my income and put it into my 401k. But if I could use a week of my PTO, you know, I, I, can, I can get there. Speaking of executives, I read that you offer the option in some cases to donate your PTO hours to other employees or to convert it into a not-for-profit donation, which seems to me like that might be appealing to any number of executives. And that is. And and those and those are the areas of the product <clears throat> or the plans of the product, I should say, that do get an uptick from the executive. So the ability to take your week and to give it to a nonprofit. And, and if your company has matching dollars, to receive those matching dollars along with it, we have that capability. We integrate directly to the IRS's database of 501c3s. So we have like 1.9 million uh, that you can give to. We have a full like giving and matching platform running behind it. And we have some of our clients that use that. And then we have the ability, and this is the one that I, I really like this. It doesn't get used as much as I wish, but the ability to share your time with another coworker who's in need. And this was used in COVID a lot. We had a lot of companies come and, and, and turn this on. And it was the, I got COVID, I took on my PTO, and now my parents have COVID. And I need to take time off, you know, because I have elder parents. I need to take time off to, to help care for them, okay? I need more time off. Well, <clears throat> the ability to say, I didn't get COVID, I have extra time, I can, I can give it to you, or I can put it into a sharing pool that can be dispersed out to others. And this is one that we have seen a lot of the executives say, because they get a lot of time off. I have six weeks, I'm gonna donate that time or four weeks into the sharing pool at my pay rate as an executive. And it has a monstrous impact on the rank and file because the rank and file don't make that much. So, you know, they're going to get 40 hours at their pay rate compared to the executive. We had one CEO who said after he donated, and this was after a hurricane in Florida, who said that he did not 
when he signed up for the platform, he didn't think it would have an effect on his culture. And what happened was the hurricane happened. There was a lot of people, kind of mainly the rank and file, that were uh, needing help. He donated six weeks of his time. It impacted almost 70 people in his company. And and he didn't he, he did it anonymously, but somehow it got out that he had done this. And he was getting all these thank yous from his employees, right, for sharing that most intimate thing, which is time that he accrued. And he really felt like, boy, now I'm in the foxhole. They, they know I'm with them. And it just builds a different culture and community when the executives actually come down to that level and say, you know, thank you. You know, we're, we're here to support you. And that's just one of the things that occurred. And I think if executives actually did more of that, I think that th their companies would be behind them more and they wouldn't have such, you know, bad gratings. Did you know that 68 percent of workers say a hybrid workplace is their preference? Make hybrid work for everyone with Robin. Robin is the industry-leading flexible workplace platform for connecting people with rooms, desks, and each other. We've helped companies like Peloton, Toyota, and Hulu build better workplace experiences. Plus, we integrate with the tools you already know and love. To learn more about how we make flexible work a reality, visit www.robinpowered.com. Did you know that 68% of workers say a hybrid workplace is their preference? Make hybrid work for everyone with Robin. Robin is the industry-leading flexible workplace platform for connecting people with rooms, desks, and each other. We've helped companies like Peloton, Toyota, and Hulu build better workplace experiences. Plus, we integrate with the tools you already know and love. To learn more about how we make flexible work a reality, visit www.robinpowered.com. And what a great example of how to build employee trust and rapport and loyalty in an authentic and genuine way. And one of the genius aspects of what you've built in my mind is you've really challenged the idea that something that we think is fixed could be flexible, right? We think, well, PT hours, and there's so many of them, and just you get them. And I wonder what would happen if we all looked around our organizations at these various aspects of culture and leadership that we believe to be fixed and challenged ourselves to think about how those principles or policies or core values even could become more flexible. A hundred percent. And that's what I think organizations really do need to do, especially in a time where you got to come into the office of the flexible work uh, mode where you're working from home. And, and I think a lot of companies... And, and this is just, uh, this is my opinion. OK, so I'm going to say this is my opinion. Everyone's got a little of their own. But I think the work from home is is great. It's great if you have families and you need to be home at certain hours to get the kids and, and all those things. That's wonderful. But a company does miss out on the building of its culture if people don't come together and collaborate and and unify and have relationships relationships in a company really help drive innovation and really the best outcome for a company. So, you know, the whole work from home or work from office, I believe you got to have a little of both. It can't be one or the other. You think about flexible, non-flexible, you know, we're in this mode where things are changing at a very rapid rate. And so all those fixed things need to be reconsidered in a way that, that benefits both the company from a cultural standpoint and the employee from I have a life and a family and children and, you know, I'm on this life cycle. I'm in this life cycle and I need to, this kind of support. As I'm hearing you say more about company culture and flexibility, what comes to mind for me is the number of listeners that might be leading or are employees of organizations with unlimited PTO. What would you say to them? Does this make what you offer at the PTO exchange irrelevant? I mean, if I have unlimited PTO, do I have anything to trade? How does that work? Unlimited PTO is the unintended consequence of a, of a poorly written law in California. And that's where it came from, period. And the law was that was written that if you accrue or if your PTO was earned and on the balance sheet, it needed to be, a, it needed to be paid out at separation. And that was the law in California. And what companies started to look at is how do we get around this? 
because companies are very good at finding ways to be profitable. And they said, well, let's not accrue it so we don't have to pay it out when we riff and or when they leave. And it doesn't grow over time on our books. OK, so financially, it's it's a huge impact to them. And so that's kind of how it started is, hey, let's just not accrue it. It didn't get accrued. It didn't get earned. We don't have to pay it out. OK, let's just call it unlimited. And then they say, you just, you're an adult, Karen, just get the job done. And then you can take as much time off as you want. The problem, Karen, is job's never done. It's never, never done. And so taking time off is very difficult. And, you, the, you know, we found that you usually take less if you have unlimited. But the other thing that I don't like about it is it doesn't build equality. My hours are you know, not as strict. I don't have to be in there. I, you know, there's certain things and I can take more time off or maybe I'm an engineer and I've already got my project done. I'm fast at it. I can take as much time off, but yet the person down the way who's maybe it's a secretary or something that's always on call can't do that. Right. And we did a study, we just did a study and it, and it showed that, you know, Unlimited actually has this burnout flavor to it, and and it really builds this inequality into the workforce because it, each manager decides who gets to take time off and how much instead of you get three weeks. So, I, I mean, if you're going to do unlimited, I think it has to be a very strict policy and it has to have a lot of guidelines. And I think there needs to be training around it, period, from that standpoint. But I like the ability because I'm an accountant that everyone accounts for their, you know, their their amount. And when I look on my paycheck and I see three weeks, I know I got three weeks of PTO instead of this looking at your paycheck going, I got unlimited and I don't know how much I can take off. And so there's a lot of people and it's usually the rank and file. It's usually the, the diverse group that are saying, I don't want to risk my job for taking time off. And I hadn't thought about the degree to which, yeah, the degree to which it could be a workplace equity issue. Somebody feels like I'm the boss's favorite or I'm high enough up or whatever the scenario might be. I'm comfortable taking as much time as I want under this policy. And somebody else might say, I don't know where I stand and I feel like this could be held or used against me. So I better never take a break. Whether you're african-american whether you're lgbtq you know and any of these minorities you already feel like you're under the gun and <laughs> so if, if it's not explained to you how much you can take you don't feel like you can because all you're ever doing is trying to <laughs> to come out from underneath uh, your differences which is very very difficult and so unlimited builds huge inequalities in in workforces as we're talking about culture and training and benefits, I'm curious from your point of view, what is the most important either trend to watch or thing that you believe every HR leader and benefits administrator needs to know right now to be more effective in their role? I think the change is very rapid right now. And I think HR one, I think a lot of CFOs discount HR, which I, I can't stand that. But I think HR needs to be looking at all the technology changes that are going on in the world, meaning around AI and crypto and tokenization. And how is that going to parlay into the world of benefits and HR? And it's going to come quickly. It will come quickly. And and some of those things are going to add some incredible flexibility and capabilities for HR to really deliver benefits and value to employees. You know, I think like any person who's in HR or in technology, you always have to be reading about the future because that future is it's closer than you think it is. It really is. I mean, who would have thought AI two years ago? And now it's exploding and now it's taking jobs. And now you hear IBM saying, you know, we're going to remove 7,000 jobs because we can do it in AI. I think HR needs to be very proactive in, in learning and educating themselves in these areas that may seem outside of HR, but they aren't. They are, they are not because HR is 
They're the ones who manage 70% of the expense of the organization. <laughs> so, so people are your most expensive thing. And how do you keep those people happy? How do you educate those people to be a better resource to the company and grow the company's bottom line? What is one piece of wisdom or advice that you would offer to the entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs and, you know, aspiring people in that direction who are listening to the show? Don't do it. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I no, hope your investors no, are not listening no, right now. Right? No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm a believer that without risk, there's no reward. And I'm, I'm a big believer that you, you have to jump off the cliff. You, you really, and I know it's, it's really hard. Like you have to do hard things. And the hardest thing is looking at yourself in the mirror. If, if you found a problem that you want to solve to go after it and to, and, and not ask for forgiveness and, and not ask for uh, someone to say it's okay. And I think everyone's looking for someone to say yes. And if you're going to go do this, you have to remember that the world is going to be all about no's. It's not going to be about yeses. It's going to be about no's. And I can tell you, you, you get so many no's. So, so many no's. Nobody, nobody wants, nobody believes it can be done. Nobody believes in your business. Nobody. And in turn, you have to almost kind of disengage yourself from that as, uh, you know, and you're just solving a problem. It, it's very, <laughs> it's really hard. It's really, really hard. And I'll give you an example. My wife did not want me to do this business. Yep. Well, everyone wants to know if you're still married now. I am very married. 33 <laughs> right. years. Yep. 33 married years, uh, very married. But sometimes you just have to go against, you know, even those that are closest to you to make, not make a point, but to solve the problem. Now today, she's happy, right? Because it all worked out. But when you're married to an entrepreneur, it's not an easy, it's not an easy life. Normalize no and celebrate the occasional yes. That's oh my what I gosh. heard, right? You, Take the you, sting out of the no. You, 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 we celebrate every little yes <laughs> there is. <laughs> every win. Well, speaking of celebrating, and we talked about coming to the office, on the show, we like to imagine that we're gathered around this virtual water cooler, you know, for that old school spontaneous chat that used to happen. And what I like to do is ask guests just five quick questions. You say the first thing that comes to your mind. It helps everybody get to know you a little bit just as a person. Right. So what time of day do you do your best creative work? Uh, 6 a.m. Okay. And speaking of time, imagine every day now has 25 hours instead of 24 hours. What are you doing with your extra hour? Uh, working. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your wife is listening. She, he's making good on his promise. All right. If you had to eat one meal every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Sushi. Oh, love it. Now the zombie apocalypse is coming. Who are three people on your team? My wife, my current uh, two partners. Awesome. You're in good company. <laughs> and how can listeners learn more about you and your company and stay connected? Uh, you can you can visit us at ptoexchange.com or follow us um, on LinkedIn or Twitter. That's probably the best way. If you need to get a hold of me, you can just reach me at info at PTO Exchange. It comes directly to me. Everybody listening now be can become an advocate for the PTO Exchange inside of their own organizations. Well, thank you to Rob Whalen, CEO and co-founder at PTO Exchange, for joining us today on Success From Anywhere, because success is not a destination. Success is not a location. Success is available to anyone, anytime, anywhere. Thanks for listening.